We have one more consideration to address in reference to the principle of thanksgiving and how it serves as the greatest form of praise to God. This is the expression the Apostle Paul uses in Hebrew 13. This is where Paul uses his extensive training in the laws of the kingdom of God to interpret the substance in the shadow lessons of the sacrificial laws demonstrated in the procedures related to the Christ altar of burnt offering. Paul references how the enlightened community in the ecclesial age is permitted to eat the sin offering whose blood went into the holy place, unlike the priests of the previous kingdom age. In Hebrews 13, reading at verse 11, Paul writes, We have an altar, whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Paul then advises us how to understand and implement the next maturing stage in God's continuing development of the saints that, that we go forth to Jesus outside the camp in order to pursue the continuing city, referencing that new Jerusalem that John interprets in Revelation as the bride of the Lamb. And then Paul progresses to the next exhortational stage, which is the application of the three categories of the peace offering that love offering, paralleling the three great divine laws of love. Uh, just dropping down to verse 15, uh, Paul writes, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to share, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. We've noted in the past how these three categories of service define those three peace offering divisions of thanksgiving, the performance of vows, and the free will offering. Now what we need to do is focus our attention on the phrase Paul uses in reference to that first service category, which is the thankfulness of praise in giving thanks to God's name. We're told that giving thanks to God qualifies as the fruit of our lips. The principle of fruitfulness is a very significant component of that first witness of God, which is creation, the spoken word of God. Creation certainly preceded the Bible, uh, God's written testimony, which is why I call creation the first chronologically witness of God. Fruitfulness is a key component of the agricultural testimony of the terms and features and operating structure of creation. There are quite a number of categories of agricultural testimony, including the lesson of the seed, the care and development of the farming process in order to achieve that desired fruitfulness, the testimony of the three feast weeks in the laws of the kingdom of God, the lesson of decay, the science of mathematics and physics, there are a number of different but very complementary lessons offered by the divine witness of creation. I particularly enjoyed the observations of Brother Islip Collier, an experienced and rather accomplished agriculturist. agriculturalist. He wrote a book almost 100 years ago titled The Vegetable in the Witness Box. We've noted some of Brother Collier's observations previously in this series of classes, he noted the considerable difference between the meager fruitfulness of wild plants as opposed to the far greater fruitfulness resulting from carefully cultivated plants that are fed, watered, and protected. Before we consider the agricultural testimony of fruitfulness, and particularly in the context of thankfulness, let's just recognize how this value distinction between cultivated and wild is validated in the context of animal husbandry as well. We've observed this same wild versus domesticated distinction in relation to the blood laws of the animals that God defined as being clean under the laws of the kingdom of God. Clean animals could be eaten without jeopardizing the required physical holiness standards that God absolutely demanded. But there were two categories of these clean animals that were distinguished by what was done with their blood. 
the blood of the domesticated clean animals with those three qualifying distinctions of a parted foot, chewing the cud, and specifically a cloven hoof, that lifeblood uh, of those domesticated animals had to be exclusively poured out at the Christ altar of burnt offering. The enlightened community was not allowed to kill and eat their cattle or sheep or goats or their turtle doves or pigeons while they were traveling those 40 years in the wilderness. Those domesticated animals were exclusively to be used for sacrifices at the tabernacle. But the blood of the wild, clean animals, like antelope, uh, water buffalo, mountain goat, was never acceptable at the Christ altar in the tabernacle courtyard. That lifeblood had to be poured out into the dust and then covered with dust. We've noted in the past the spiritual implications of these two separate blood handling distinctions. That blood, that life of the wild, undomesticated, clean animals was bound to the dust and therefore the curse of the dust from that Garden of Eden curse, dust thou art to dust you shall return. This divinely imposed distinction between the wild and the domesticated, clean beasts demonstrates a divine value equation. God values the lives of those within the enlightened community who faithfully and humbly submit to the terms of his righteousness. The lives of those faithful are bound to the Christ altar, just like the blood of those sacrificial, domesticated animals. But God does not value the lives of those within the enlightened community who are not faithful, but wild and rebellious, those who demonstrate ungodly behavior and ungodly understandings. The lives of these within the enlightened community are bound to the curse of the dust, as opposed to the Christ altar. As we noted in the past, the volume of clean animals whose blood would not be acceptable at the altar far outnumber the few domesticated clean beasts. This confirms the declaration by Jesus that many will be called to the judgment, but only a few are going to be chosen by him. But our primary focus in this divine acceptability differential, demonstrated in the animal category of creation, is how this distinction between wild and domesticated parallels the agricultural testimony of creation. Just like the clean animals demonstrated a differential in divine acceptability in those uh, in these wild or domesticated distinctions, so we can witness a different value, uh, divine value distinction in the agricultural category of fruit-bearing plant life between carefully cultivated or domesticated fruit-bearing plant life and wild or poorly attended fruit-bearing plant life. First, let's recognize that the enlightened community is defined from one end of scripture to the other as being represented by fruit-bearing plant life, such as the fig tree, the, the olive tree, the vineyard, grain fields. These, those three harvest feasts mandated during the first kingdom age shadow project the three divine harvestings of Christ and the two sets of saints. They're agriculturally defined. The unenlightened are only defined as non-fruit-bearing plant life, such as briars, thorns, weeds, and simply grass. This too offers a direct parallel to creation's animal testimony, as the un <coughs> unclean animals, that even far greater population of animals, as opposed to the clean animals, had no blood handling rules whatsoever. Not the altar, not the dust, nothing. The lives of the unenlightened, represented as those unclean animals, had no divine significance whatsoever. This is also the case with the spiritual identification of the non-fruit-bearing plant life as well. The point of separation between the enlightened faithful and the enlightened unfaithful in the context of this scripture-wide agricultural testimony is this issue of fruitfulness. Fruitfulness is what God wants. This is what Christ's parable of the sower makes very clear. 
as well as his parable of the wheat and the tares. There's a direct relationship between fruitfulness and the faithful behavior and understandings of the enlightened community in God's laws of the early and the latter reigns. Let's just review that in Deuteronomy chapter 11, uh, picking up verse 10. For the land whither thou goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt from whence you came out, where you sowed your seed and watered it with your foot as a garden of herbs. Uh, but the land whither you go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys and drinks water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even to the end of the year. And it shall come to pass if you shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your corn, your wine, your oil. And I will send grass in your fields for your cattle, that you may eat and be full. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, unless you perish quickly from off the land, the good land which the Lord gives you. Therefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart and your soul, and bind them as a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. The promised land was geographically designed by the Creator to be dependent on the weather cycle those rains from heaven. The divine equation was that if the enlightened community would diligently hearken to God's commandments, let's note, note that word diligent, not lazy, not convenient, but diligent, that they would enjoy agricultural bounty, fruitfulness. If they let their hearts deceive them and were less than diligent, then that agricultural bounty would be shut off. There is a direct relationship. Now, just for the purpose of depth, a relation to this law of the early and the latter rains, we should understand these early and latter rains have three scriptural parallels that demonstrate this early and latter rain status. These are the spoken word of God, the word made flesh, of course, referring to Jesus Christ, and thirdly, the word of God expressed in power, which basically refers to the pouring out of God's Holy Spirit, power on the enlightened community. Each of these word of God categories are scripturally defined in the context of rain, and particularly early and latter rains. The early rains ended, in all three applications, with the combination of Jesus leaving for heaven, and then the timing parallel of the conclusion of the written word of God in the New Testament and the elimination of the Holy Spirit gifts after those promised two generations of Jews and Jewish and Gentile believers. The period following the ending of the early reigns is defined in Scripture as the prophesied period of God's self-imposed silence, the drought of the word of God and the sun setting on the prophets. The prophetic latter reigns with all three categories, the spoken word of God, the word made flesh, and the miraculous power of God poured out on the faithful, will coincide with the restoration of the kingdom of God following the return of Jesus Christ. And this is why we are told by James to wait for the coming of the Lord as the farmer waits for the early and the latter rains. This is why Hosea describes the prophesied second resurrection in the plan of God at the res restoration of the kingdom as being like early and latter rains, and why Joel, uh, why Joel defines the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in the context of the early and latter rains. Our primary point in all this context is the absolute significance of fruitfulness for divine approval, particularly in the spiritual distinctions of creation's agricultural and animal husbandry testimony in relation to the enlightened community. Fruitfulness makes all the difference in the world in relation to encouraging 
God's and Christ's favor. Now, what is odd is how so many teachers and writers in our enlightened community over the last few generations have denied this principle of a required fruitfulness. It has been repeatedly presented by some of our most respected teachers that there is no such thing as personal righteousness. Personal righteousness is, rather obviously, that same fruitfulness emphasis in creation's testimony that is shouted silently for the exclusive filtered access for those always historically few within the enlightened community who have developed ears that hear. We've addressed this issue of personal righteousness in previous classes. We've noted the abundant use of personal possessive pronouns in reference to righteousness. My righteousness, your righteousness, our righteousness, their righteousness. One would think this issue of how the degree of God's righteousness that we demonstrate personally and individually in our lives uh, through our words and deeds is identified exclusively with the ones presented presenting those words and deeds that this would not be difficult to respect but the deceitfulness of the human heart insists that well righteousness is only imputed and all we need is some minimal not diligent, but minimal degree of what is called faith in order to access that common assignment of Christ's imputed righteousness and that ungodly behavior is automatically forgiven in all cases despite how insulting to God one's behavior and expressions may be. The fact is God demands fruitfulness, that personal and individual expressions of God's righteousness uh, qualified in how we demonstrate God's righteousness in our words and in our deeds. God is the only, the exclusive standard for righteousness, for what is right. If we're not demonstrating his rightness in our words and deeds, then there is no personal righteousness to claim individually. One of the more powerful exhortations from the agricultural testimony of creation concerning this divine expectation of fruitfulness is the lesson of the grapevine. The vineyard is a common representation of the enlightened community throughout scripture in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. God designed the, cre the grape grapevine to have a very limited purpose. So we read in Ezekiel chapter 15, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree? Or than a branch which is among the trees in a forest? Shall wood be taken thereof to do any work? Or will men take a pin of it to hang any vessel thereon? Behold, it is cast into the fire for fuel. The fire devours both the ends of it, and the midst of it is burned. Is it meat for any work? Behold, when it was whole, it was not it was meat for no work. How much less shall it be meat? Yet for any work, when the fire has devoured it, and it is burned. Therefore thus says the Lord God, As the vine tree among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so will I give the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will set my face against them, and they shall know that I am the Lord, when I set my face against them. And I will make the land desolate, because they have committed a trespass, says the Lord God. God designed the grapevine to provide creational testimony that demonstrates the same standard of righteousness that's presented in his written word. But just like all the features and operating structure to be seen and heard in creation. There is absolutely no value to be realized in a grapevine that does not generate fruitfulness, except as fuel for a fire. There's absolutely no value to be realized in someone within the enlightened community who does not generate personal righteousness, that fruitfulness that God has a right to expect, well, except to be consumed in that lake of fire that Revelation 20 defines as the second death, meaning to perish forever. 
So when we read Paul's statement in Hebrews 13 about how thanking God serves as not just praise, but qualifies as the fruit of our lips, this expression blends perfectly within very extensive scriptural and creational testimony patterns. Once again, we can see the depth of value in this principle of being thankful to God, this appreciation for whatever we have, this projection of the ultimate state of completeness, this rejection of the serpent influence of lusting and wanting more and unsatisfaction. For all this breadth and height and depth of evidence, we can understand that thanking God is the greatest category of praise that we can offer our Heavenly Father and His Son. Therefore, we should think, actively meditate about how we can personally manifest that thankfulness in our words and our deeds. Besides just some, some casual memorized phrase in an ecclesial prayer or just a meal. We have considered thankfulness to be a very positive behavior pattern. Let's also consider how unthankfulness, the absence of thankfulness, is defined as a very negative behavior pattern. In fact, being unthankful, which is a distinct feature of our current global society, with our presumptions of entitlements and demands for rights, being unthankful is, is identified in Scripture with the path to apostasy, that natural progression from understanding and believing the terms of God's righteousness to the more popular and self-worshipping imaginations of the hearts of mankind. Isn't the religion of evolution a perfect example of how the absence of being thankful is the platform for self-worshipping errors in understandings. It is very unscientifically hypothesized that our natural order was the result of hundreds of millions of years of subtle but steady evolutionary improvements. That we don't have a creator to, to thank for the warmth of the sun or the bounty of the field or the food we eat, the air we breathe. The very obvious but oddly ignored rule of everything we can observe in our natural order is the rule of decay, that everything is always getting worse. Yet the theory of evolution is dependent on the foundational presumption that everything is always improving, which is the exact opposite of everything we can observe in our natural order. This presumption of determined improvement therefore declares that the current generation is the greatest that has ever existed, that we are the gods of the natural order, and we have no one to be thankful to, or to whom we should submit ourselves. There are several foundational insults to our Creator issuing from this delusional religion of the theory of evolution, such as the insistence that death preceded sin, that the Bible falsely testifies that assured death was introduced as a direct result of the very first sin, the very first contradiction to God's righteousness. This false teaching corrupts our capacity to understand the testimony of a number of divinely required rituals, such as animal sacrifices, baptism, and even memorial service that all focus on the issue of death and how God was right to impose death due to sin. The thankless nature of the religion of evolution is a demonstration how thanklessness is a catalyst for the natural progression of apostasy. Let's consider how Paul highlights this fact in relation to the judgment of God against the enlightened community, and particularly in the context of how creation itself testifies against the thankless frame of reference, that thankless frame of reference, which is, of course, a direct contradiction 
to the religion of evolution. In Romans chapter 1, Paul explains this issue. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like two corruptible men, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever." First, let's dispense with the common misconception presented again by respected teachers in our community who deflect the impact of this warning away from the enlightened community, insisting this judgment from heaven has to be applied outside the enlightened community. That's an absolutely impossible application. We're told exactly who it is to whom the wrath of God will be revealed from heaven. It is to those who hold the truth, but not in righteousness. That's only the enlightened community who could ever be described as holding the truth. The unenlightened do not hold the truth in any way whatsoever. This sort of deflection of an expression of divine disfavor away from ourselves is quite common in our particular last generation of the ecclesial age. There's a very common presumption of almost universal divine acceptability in our brotherhood that completely contradicts every historical precedent and every generation of the enlightened community in the entire Bible. The common denominators in this deflection of criticism are an absence of the fear of God, an absence of a fear of judgment, an extremely poor level of knowledge about divine truths, in other words, the features of God's righteousness, and the elevation of the love of people above the truths of God and above the love of God. So we have this warning by the Apostle Paul about how the wrath of God will be revealed from heaven, and it will be directed to those who actually hold the truth, but do not hold it in righteousness. We're the generation that will witness the revealing of the wrath of God. Jesus Christ returns first for judgment, and it will be directed to those who are accountable to the vindication of God's righteousness, of which the enlightened community will be the largest component by far. We're told those to whom the wrath of God will be directed will be without any excuse. And and why they'll have no excuse for holding the truth without righteousness? Because... That which may be known about of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. This is that chronologically first witness of God that we've been endlessly referencing in these classes, the testimony of creation. The things that have been made of course, made by God, Um, those things testify about God's eternal power and Godhead. Therefore, those who do hold the truth, but without righteousness, will be completely without any excuse before their judge. It is creation's testimony and how it perfectly parallels the Bible testimony that completely obliterates any legitimacy to the godless and completely unscientific delusion of evolution, and particularly its corrupted version of of theistic evolution. 
we've considered just, just a smidgen of the testimony of creation with how the design of the universe is a template for God's design of the ecclesia in the wilderness uh, when the first kingdom of God was established at Sinai. We've considered how molecular structure and atomic structure testifies about divine principles, uh, the agricultural process, the, the witness of the seed and fruitfulness, the principle of decay, the prophesied rest from the physical effects of sin when those four sin icons are chained in the bottomless pit at the beginning of the restored kingdom of God. There's a massive amount of more evidence available if we were, are willing to listen with ears that hear to creation's gospel. It's this hidden glory in how the things that have been made testify to the same terms of God's righteousness as the Bible that cements our confidence and provides definition for our correct understandings of God's righteousness so that we can personally have the capacity to hold unto the truth but with righteousness so that when we're judged, we won't be prompted to sputter any defensive excuses. Paul references how the enlightened community regularly shifted their worship from Yahweh to the very features of creation through which God manifested himself. The generations of our enlightened community have regularly become wise in our own eyes, which has an automatic corrupting influence in our imaginations, changing the truth of God into a lie, which leads to the end result of worshiping ourselves, the creature, as opposed to the creator. This is yet another expression that identifies the enlightened community. Those who hold the truth, but not in righteousness, are also those who change the truth of God into a lie. Only those who have the truth in the first place have the capacity to change it. Pagans, paganized Christianity, Islam, Buddhists, atheists, these certainly don't have the capacity to change the truth, as they don't have the truth in the first place. This changing of the truth of God into a lie and worshiping, worshiping the creature, ourselves, instead of God, is something that only can be done by those who have the truth to change in the first place. But our initial and primary point in examining this warning by Paul was to note how the absence of thankfulness is directly associated with the progression of apostasy. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So it had light, but it became darkened. It isn't the absence of love or the absence of kindness or forgiveness that are highlighted about the enlightened community directly prompting a progressive apostasy. It is not being thankful. Not being thankful led to vain imaginations and the darkening of foolish hearts. Another highly unpleasant but direct prophecy about our last generation of the enlightened community is presented by Paul in his last letter. It was his second letter to his beloved Timothy. We're told this letter was written before Paul came before Nero the second time. Historically, we're told this is when Paul was executed by Nero. Now, since Paul was a citizen of Rome, he could not be crucified. So the understanding is that he was beheaded. Obviously, this was before the Roman destruction of Jerusalem, as that was done under the direction of Titus, General Titus, who was the son of Vespasian, who succeeded Nero as emperor when Nero died in the fire in Rome in the year 69 of the Common Era. Paul's last letter concludes with a prophecy of the enlightened community in what is defined as the last days. Well, that's exactly how we define our generation, that we are in the last days, the last days of the ecclesial age, immediately preceding the restoration of the kingdom of God by returned Jesus Christ. So Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3, uh, starting in verse 1, <clears throat> This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, 
boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So let's let's highlight the issue of being unthankful in verse 2. But let's put that in the context of resisting the truth and being reprobate, meaning unprincipled, concerning the truth. Again, this describes people who are within the frame of the truth, resisting it, and are also unprincipled concerning that same truth environment. Again, this is a highly uncomplimentary prophecy of the enlightened community in what is described here as the last days. The description of ever learning, but not able to come to the knowledge of the truth, is the declaration of our enlightened generation's endless errors about the terms of God's righteousness and our corporate unconcern with the principle of truth in the first place. Also, let's note the degree of ungodly behavior that Paul prophesies is going to be evident in those that he's defining. This is obviously not our society, as his descriptions would be extremely mild compared to the constant murderous shootings of strangers in elementary schools, malls, workplaces, the incredibly immoral and utterly disgusting entertainment industry, the exaltation of ungodly same-sex relationships and rotating gender identifications, and the weapons of mass destruction, such as biological weapons and atomic weapons. Paul's prophecies of the degree of ungodly behavior in the last days is clearly focused on the enlightened community and not society in general. Paul describes us as lovers of our own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful. This is a description of the enlightened community in the last days, our days. One of those issues is being unthankful. Now, fortunately, this is a community description, not a universal description. We can individually escape this identification if we will actually love God more than ourselves, if we'll refuse to participate in the global pandemic of covetousness, if we will practice true meekness and not the common social respect of fake humility, if we will honor our parents, keep our promises, if we'll pursue holiness. Pursuing holiness is an extremely rare goal in our current enlightened community. If we will never accuse falsely, and if we will not despise those that are actually good among us, we can't be satisfied with only a form of godliness. We need to be transformed by the power of godlikeness. But the behavior we want to particularly highlight would be being thankful. The absence of thankfulness is once again highlighted as a negative behavior pattern in our last generation of the ecclesial age. At one point in the ministry of Jesus, he healed 10 lepers. This is recorded in Luke chapter 17. Um, we read, and as he entered into a certain village, there met him 10 men that were lepers, which stood afar off. They lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were, not, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to glory, give glory to God, save this stranger. 
And he said unto him, Arise, go your way, your faith has made you whole. Notice how Jesus identifies this thankfulness by the Samaritan former leper as returning to give glory to God, and that 90% of those healed did not return to give thanks. Let's also note that common issue of faith that was so effective in this process. This is not a shallow faith, one merely verbally expressed. This faith prompted that thankfulness and the glory resulting from that thankfulness. It should also be noted how the very next issue in this record is Christ's prophecies of the last generation, the generation when the kingdom should come. This was the demand of the Pharisees, exactly when the kingdom would be established. Uh, we read, dropping down to verse 20, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom should come, he answered them. Now, the answer of Jesus as to when the kingdom would come is the parallel to two times when God judged the enlightened community for their ungodliness. First were the days of Noah. There's no record of any doctrinal apostasy before the flood. The first record of false understandings begin at Babel in the future from the flood, uh, later known as, as Babylon. Despite the fact that everyone prior to the flood qualified as enlightened, there was certainly a behavioral apostasy. Jesus defines the generation witnessing his return uh, to this judgment of the enlightened community in the flood. Then he references God's judgment on the city of Sodom, where there was a substantial ecclesia that had followed Lot away from Abram uh, to the plains of the Jordan, and after their abduction by the five kings and being saved by Abram and, and God, of course, they moved into Sodom and conformed to the extreme ungodliness of the Sodomites. Lot pleads with the men demanding access to Lot's visitors as his brethren, using the same term we use for the members of our brotherhood. Peter refers to how Lot was vexed by the ungodliness of those among whom he lived in Sodom. It would be the increasing immoral degradation of the hundreds of Christadelphians that accompanied him away from Abram that would have vexed Lot's soul so severely. Only three people came out of that destruction in Sodom alive, with necessarily hundreds of the enlightened community being incinerated, including the two fiancés of Lot's daughters, who laughed at the thought that they could possibly be so unacceptable to God that they would be in danger of God's judgments. The punctuating statement that Jesus offers is, Remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife was part of the enlightened community, originally part of Abram's community. This parallel in Luke 17, immediately following the thankless nine healed lepers, is a very uncomplimentary prophecy of our exact generation of the enlightened community. Therefore, we need to beware of unthankfulness which according to the prophecies are very common in our enlightened community at this stage in the plan of God, just prior to the establishment of the kingdom. We need to have a plan, an agenda for genuine, expressing our genuine thankfulness to God, uh, to witnessing the, the provisions, the care, uh, the range of access we have to God's glory. We need to be thankful and express it not just in word but in deed as well. So our next class will concentrate on another divine principle, the principle of judgment. <laughs>